everybody's got different opportunities but just be self-aware but don't compare i promise you everything happens for a reason your blessings are coming just be self-aware but do not compare don't be envious of anybody in a different situation don't hate on nobody because they got different opportunities i promise you doors are coming because i wasn't always the best player i wasn't always this you know highly ranked or whatever actually ranked at all so actually at the beginning of my senior year like i was taking visits to d3s you know what i'm saying like d2s d3s so i'm like exploring all options i'm like okay i just want to play college basketball and then I'm like okay no like throughout the course of the senior year i'm like putting 25 on all these like high rated recruits like we're beating them like i'm like at that point, it's like, no way you're supposed to be here and I'm here. Chilling, chilling. How you living? How you feeling? Straight. I feel that. I feel that. I mean, you just dropped 30 and hit a hit a hit some game with your throw. So I guess I've heard worse days. I've heard coming off of work. <laughs> Right. We're in 2021. We're almost a year since COVID lockdown, at least from the state, from the United States perspective. I want to start off. I want to ask you, what have you learned um, about yourself since this whole COVID situation has happened? Um, I feel like I learned that I'm a lot more patient than I used to be. Um with lockdown and everything. So you spend a lot of time just like by yourself, um, not knowing like what's gonna happen next. We've had games get postponed, games get canceled, uh, competitions get canceled. And a lot of times you just gotta sit around and wait and just see what happens. And I mean, I haven't had a, like that much trouble with it. So, and I'm not a very patient person, but I mean, COVID has kind of forced me to be a lot more patient, so. I say that's one thing I learned about uh, myself that I have the capacity to do that. So when everything opens back up again, you know, just gonna hit the ground like full speed. So it's gonna make it uh, even that much better. Yeah, like I and, and that self awareness too, just to realize like you know that you can see. All right, I'm improving, and or this is something I always struggle with. Let me see if I can actually do it, and. It's crazy how it takes adversity for us to realize like, oh, I really could do it. You know what I'm saying? So to also expound upon that, have you learned a, a new skill or added something new to your everyday routine since COVID has happened? Um, I've been working more with like, on the media side of things, like, making videos like graphics um because i have a couple um like other side things that i do like um with my business and then just like doing stuff like that like making graphics for that putting together videos for that um like making ads kind of so sort of that kind of thing and it's actually it's, it's actually kind of fun like just creating like new stuff out of nothing so i mean i've never been that artistic or that you know could draw could do all that other stuff but i mean with all this technology and computers you don't need that you just got to be organized and, and have a vision and, and just put what's in your head onto the screen so i mean that kind of stuff i've been doing a lot uh during this time yeah and to your point i i i'm the same way like the graphic design, the this whole podcast show, recording, editing, I didn't know none of this. You know, I quit. I was communications major and I quit it because I remember they started making us do computer classes and editing. I was like, for the birds, let me go to sports management. You know what I mean? So for me, this is all new and I'm learning it in the graphic design and, and the Photoshop. So I would love for you, man, this is a platform where I, I like athletes or people who have been in athletics their whole career and now they're starting to pivot and do different things and realize, you know, there's different ways and different ventures they can pursue. I'd love for you to talk about your, your side hustles, you know what I'm saying? Because eventually they're going to be the main hustle. That's the goal, at least, or to sell it off. So um, if, if however much, because I don't know, you know, trademarks and patent and all that stuff, as much as you can tell, I'd love for you to um, talk about your side hustles. 
Um, so I got um my uh like kind of lifestyle line. Um, you know, I connect personally with it. Uh, I see a lot of a lot of uh guys who just um and there's nothing wrong with it, but they like they just like they get a logo, they put their name on it, they push that. I wanted to do something that like doesn't have my name directly attached to it, but it still kind of like expresses uh like what I do. Like I'm a basketball player. And so that's why I started like professional sports club. Like and if you're a hooper, like the name's hard. <laughs> like every you know what I'm saying, everybody wanna score. Like I'm a professional scorer. So I'm like, all right, professional scores club, like that can connect with a lot of hoopers. Like, and then that's how it started. And then even more so, like going into this next summer, I'm trying to push it past that. Like, I want to push it to like football, baseball, you know, because it's all the same thing. You hit home runs, you would score. Like, that's what you do. You score professionally. Like, you score touchdowns, you throw touchdowns. You would score, like, you just like, find what you're good in in life and, and and score like you're a professional sport like so join the club you know what I'm saying so that's the that's the main two like taglines I've been running with join the club welcome to the club it's like just trying to push that from a um, like all athletic standpoint so this summer is going to be big and expanding that and then that's where the, uh, the graphic design the editing the marketing I've been working on the quarantine it's going to come like full circle and I'm going to have a full summer to just put content together and, and try to really push it. You have it like trademark patent pending and all that, right? Just in case, because that's a hard name, bro. And, and yeah, uh, I feel like it's so, so catchy. I had to do that. Yeah. And, and like you said, it translates because when you hit a home run, you score. When you catch a touchdown, when you score, when you get a big sale, I like sales. That's a score. When you land a big deal, that's a score. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And people who, who do that consistently, yeah, I'm a professional scorer. So I definitely um, think that that's a hard name. And, and like you said, it's, it's a dope way for you to apply your, your passion, um, which is basketball and which is scoring the basketball. And then how do you take that, extrapolate that to, to different ways of making income and things of that nature? So, so that's definitely, that's definitely hard. And, like I said, um, I, I appreciate you sharing, man, because that's what it's about. You know, it's athletics and and um, it's such a huge platform. And if you can build your brand, like my boy, uh, Daquan Walker, he was a point guard at UCF and he had no lacking. That's his brand, uh, no lacking. And same thing you, it's, it's not his name, it's it's a brand, it, it's a standalone. And he started building that high school. and. By the time you guys get to your 30s, when you, you've you been building it for 10 years, and it's only, you're only in your 30s, it's going to be worth six, seven figures. And then it's going to run on its own. And then it expands for licensing, you know, which is people are going to be like, yo, I just want to be associated with the movement, professional scores club. So okay. let me hit up D Nick and be like, yo, how much for the license it? Or, you know what I'm saying? How much to do a, a collaboration, things like that. So, so that's dope. So, now let's go, let's go backwards for a second, right? Talk about uh, your upbringing, like your, your parents. Um, what, were they your role models or, or someone else your role models? Talk about your, your parents and, and how they like raised you. Oh, uh, definitely. They definitely are, um, you know, uh, kind of like, so my parents are separated. So, you know, two different perspectives. Um, my mom and dad, uh, they had five kids together. So five by the same mom and dad. Then my dad had uh, two more boys, my little brothers. And then my mom adopted two more girls. So five sisters, three brothers. You know, it's a lot of different dynamics at play. You learn a lot of, you learn a lot from both, dealing with um, both situations. And then, you know, those are my role models, my big sisters, uh, for sure. Uh, my oldest sister, basketball specifically she was the first she played at Yale so she was the first you know D1 Hooper so you know that was my first 21 that was my first basketball number just going to all her games when I was younger so she was the role model um, from that standpoint that's that's dope 21 D 
did she wear it because of KG? That's my that's my all time. That's my goat. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know why she wore it, but I wore I definitely wore twenty one because that's what she wore, and then I switched to thirteen just to kind of branch out on my own. Then switched again to eleven, um, just because thirteen wasn't available when I transferred. And it was just time for another change, you know, just another chapter. Your family dynamic is similar to mine, where it's like separated parents and, you know, kids on this side, kids on this side. So how do you think that helped you? And then how do you think and what was the challenge of, of that? And how did you handle that challenge, you know, growing up with that unique dynamic? Um, I would say it gave me just two very unique perspectives uh, with my dad remarrying and then just having that, you know, nuclear family, like faith, like normal, like mom, dad, stepmom, dad, or whatever, just basically just that whole family and then my mom being single and then still having so many, so many responsibilities, so many kids to take care of and just working extremely hard to make sure there was no real drop off going from home to home. So, I mean, those two very unique perspectives of kind of like one side very well put together, the other side, they both work hard, of course, but being a single mom is like nothing else in the world. And so just seeing those two different dynamics um, in the same week sometimes, you know, gave me a, like an appreciation for both. Yeah, I, I could imagine. And uh, for me, it was that was my feeling that I'm fortunate enough that I had like family friends that had that dynamic, you know what I'm saying? Where that nuclear family, like you said, because I think exposure for from a male perspective is very important because I think exposure is everything. You can't see something that you, you, uh, you can't be something that you, you haven't seen or heard. You know what I'm saying? That's we, I had a conversation about that with my with my boy, and I think you know, exposure. Like I just said, I'm just harping on it, but exposure is everything. And I was just curious on how you know that that affected you um, positively, and, or the case may be. So, the part of uh, Illinois you are from, can you describe that and and how that played a part on you know the person you are today? I'm from the South side. Um, so everything really with me like revolved around basketball pretty much. Um, not, wasn't in the streets, wasn't really with none of that. You know, you know, people in the streets, got friends in the streets that live that life, you know, but that wasn't really what I did. I played basketball, you know, I'm a hooper. Like I really stayed out of the way and away from, you know, all those other, temptations you may call them or whatever you may call them um but you know the, the basketball culture where I'm from is, is huge is everything and then especially when I was coming up in high school we had back-to-back -back, uh best player in the country um we had Jabari in the class ahead of me we had uh Cliff Alexander and Jaleel Okafor in my class so, you know, the spotlight was huge, like, um, coming up for me, so. Jabari was a monster. I'm so, I'm so sad that he had those ACL injuries, man, because he was, he reminded me of Melo, man. His game was just so smooth and, like, and he was sneaky athletic, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm so sad with his, uh, with his ACL injuries. What do you think was the difference in, like, mindset between the kids that went to go went to go do the bat the who got involved with with the recklessness and those who didn't like what do you think is the difference because you hear so many rumors about Chicago you, you know I you don't know what's what so what do you think is the difference I feel like a lot of a lot of people is just the environment they grew up around and not to say they don't have a choice but it's just like, when you're in it, you're in it. It's like, imagine like being like born in like a, a war zone. Like that's all you know, that's the life you know. It's not easy to just 
walk away from it. Like you're a kid, you're a high, you're 15, 16 years old. It's not like, okay, I'm in a bad environment. Let me move out on my own. Like you don't have that money. You don't have those advantages. And it's just the life you were born into. And then some choose like sports to get out, get a full ride, go play somewhere. And then you got those who who aren't like born like into that environment who go and they seek it out. Um, so, I mean, that's a problem too, especially when you don't have to, you know, but the, the culture when I was coming up was just so crazy. Like for me, like growing up watching like Derrick Rose, those guys, like that appealed to me. Like that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a basketball player. I wanted to do that. But then on the other hand, you got guys growing up, like we all, like we, my freshman year of high school, that's when like Chief Keith was going big, like worldwide, like him, Lil Dirt, uh, G Herbo, Bibby, like that's when they were blowing up. And so you see, uh, it's a whole group of kids who see that and they say, that's what I want to be, you know? that's what I want to be and then they take they take that route so I mean it's, it's kids born into it it's kids who go and seek it out and then it's kids who actively want to get away from it and, but at the same time it's people who actively like want to try and live that lifestyle so you get it both ways because fear and intimidation get so many eyeballs they feel like that's value and it's whack to me so um, I'm, I'm trying to be a part of the change where it's like, nah, there's other information can be entertaining. You know what I'm saying? Just who you get to talk about it and, and how they talk about it. So describe like what it took for you to be the 2014 Chicago Catholic League player of the year. Like, because that's a crazy award. That's a, that's a dope accomplishment. So describe your high school journey and what it took to reach that. So I started playing varsity probably halfway through my sophomore year. Uh, I actually played with my older brother. So we were on the same team for about half a season. That's dope. And then my, yeah. And then my junior season, uh, we were a young team, kind of under the radar, but we were going to surprise some people. And I got hurt, I think three games into my junior year. I tore my MCL and broke a bone in my leg. So, I was out for pretty much the whole year until playoffs. It could have been longer. Um, I had to decide whether to get surgery and get it 100% fixed, you know, but it wouldn't play for the rest of the season or let it heal on its own and then come back and play at the end. And high school is not like college. You can't rest your, you're not gonna get the year back. So I took the chance of not getting surgery and trying to let it heal on its own. Um, so luckily it did. Um, and then came back for the playoffs. Uh, we actually lost to uh, we lost to Jabari Parker in the second round of the playoffs. Wow. So that's that's who sent us home. So no shame in that. And then came back, got healthy. My senior season, still nobody knew who I was. Um, and then that conference, like you said, it was a crazy conference. Like I feel like every team had like two or three. Division one guys uh, that year. Like even the bad teams had three D1 guys, three or four D1 guys. So, I mean, just really just hooping every night. I mean, and the competition was there. Um, and just basically just doing what I was, like doing what I knew I was capable of, had to wait a whole year to do it, just taking advantage of the opportunity. Yeah. So, when did you? Uh, start getting offers like how and how did you start getting offers was it AU was it camps or was it senior year um senior year is when I started getting a junior year I had interest and then I got hurt and it all went away and then I had to kind of just get it back senior year I had some Ivy League schools um because that summer uh junior year summer after I got healthy I believe I went to a bunch of Ivy League camps. Like me, my dad, my brother, we drove. I think we went to like Cornell, we went to Columbia, we went to a couple of Bucknell, like some Patriot and Ivy League schools. Cause my sister went Ivy League, I had the grades. That was kind of the, like, that's what we felt the best option was. Um, 
So I had some interest from high schools after my senior season. Um, Chicago State, which was right by right by me, there, uh, one of their assistants went to the same high school as me. So that was my first offer. And but coming out of high school, I didn't like I didn't have what I wanted. Like I decided, okay, I don't want to go to Ivy League schools because you know they don't care. They care about sports, but academics is first, and that's not that wasn't for me. Like that might be for somebody else, but it wasn't for me. So I had the choice to either go JUCO or prep school. And that was just a simple choice of, do I want to take another risk going to this new prep school, but I wouldn't lose any eligibility and maybe having to go to JUCO after or go straight to JUCO to play for Billy Gillespie, old Kentucky coach, like certified, like not for sure, but if I do what I'm supposed to do, it'll be a D1. But I would only have two or three years to play. And I wanted I wanted to play all four years. So I went to prep school. And then after prep school, that's when I got a majority of my offers and interest. Okay. So talk about what kept you encouraged. Like what was your mindset through through the BS, through difficult times? Like how did you stay positive? How did you stay committed? Because in a lot of those situations is when a lot of careers go to die. You know what I'm saying? Regardless of the talent. So how did you attack that from junior year to beginning and starting that prep school journey? Um, really it's just, I feel like just keeping like what the goal in mind was, I was to play division one basketball. Um, which, I mean, it wasn't always like a certainty, like, because I wasn't always the best player. I wasn't always, you know, highly ranked or whatever, actually ranked at all. So actually at the beginning of my senior year, like I was taking visits to D3s, you know what I'm saying? Like D2s, D3s. So I'm like exploring all options. I'm like, okay, I just want to play college basketball. And then I'm like, okay, no. Like throughout the course of the senior year, I'm like, putting 25 on all these like high rated recruits like we're beating them like I'm like at that point it's like no way you're supposed to be here and I'm here and I'm like I'm killing you like it's easy like so that's when I put in my mind like all right no like I'm going D1 because I got to prove to myself that like like I got to show like I got to show people like like it's, it's no way that that person better than me or that person can do that and I can't. So I took that personally. And then from that point on, I didn't pay no attention to D3s or D2s. Not knocking that, but my goal was to go play at the highest level possible. Yeah, and I love I love you sharing that because it gives, like I said, perspective. And it, sh it showed that you realize that you had the talent, you just had to, you just needed the exposure. And I also like you sharing that because it's a lesson to people who are following a similar journey to you. It's that you realize that rankings and four star, five star, all that, that's all based on how many camps that they went to and the platform that they're playing on. That's why they get the rankings and the exposures. And you know what I'm saying? They passed the um, underwear test, which the combine. You know, that's, it's not about actual game and you, they're not seeing all the players really play. It's just from what they see, this is how they rank it. And if you feel like you have the game, if you feel like I have the skills and you prove it, then keep pursuing it because you did it. You did. That's the hardest right. part is actually doing it. <laughs> you know, right. you know what I'm saying? The rest is just fear. And then like also opportunity and, so how did you uh, position yourself to get those opportunities with the prep school and, and, and Coach Billy Gillespie? Because like you said, he's a certified coach and right. he put in works with uh, uh, University of Kentucky. Uh, well, the coach from uh, my prep school, Coach Glenn, he's a college coach for a long time and he just, he decided to, uh, to start coaching at the prep school. So he, um, he first tried to get me in with a couple D1s. He 
and got me a couple visits, but they weren't uh, they weren't sold. They didn't end up offering. And he's like, you know, you can always come play for me, like that type of deal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get you D1 without prep school, but if you don't, then like you for sure have a spot. So it was that uh, kind of deal. So I did half the year at a prep school, and it was so much like going on behind the scenes, so much drama, so much like so many like behind the scenes, like not involving me. Cause like I was starting, I was playing 30 minutes. I didn't have any problems, but it was a lot of problems with the guys who weren't playing and like their families and it was just too much. So my dad was like, no, like you're coming home. Like we'll figure, we'll figure something out. Like you got filmed from the first half of the season. We're going to rock with that. Take whatever visit you have left, like just come home. So like I did my first semester at the prep school, second semester, I went home and I was just working out on my own. Got a job, like, cause to stay like uh, eligible, you have to show like the NCAA, like, you were working, like you were doing something productive. You weren't just like sitting around. So I got a job and then I was just working out um, pretty much that whole time. And then the whole spring of 2015, just talking to coaches, you know, had a couple of different opportunities, went to a couple of visits, uh, got offered some preferred walk-ons, but again, I didn't want to do that. Like I went, I took a visit down to Southern Illinois, uh, Carbondale, worked out with their team. Uh, Bradley worked out with their team. And you know, like, I felt like I was competing, like I belonged, like I was there for the preferred walk-on, preferred walk-on. And I was like, mm, I'm all right. And then Albany called, they saw film, they liked me, they didn't offer yet. They wanted to fly me out, visit, and then again, like, they worked me out. And then after I work out, like, walking to the car, they offered me after the workout. And so it was like, at that moment, I was like, all right, finally, somebody like, like, you see, like, okay, film, you see in person, it's like, okay, like, they pulled the trigger. And then I like everything they had to say. It was a good situation. And then that's where I ended up uh, committing. That's that's dope. So I didn't even realize. So when you're in that situation, when you're fighting for scholarships, when you take these visits, it's not just, hey, look at the facilities. It's, hey, look at the facilities. But also you came here to compete, like similar to how you hear with professional leagues, you know, when they visit and they have to work out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's most, I mean, for the higher recruits, like, you got offers, it's just, it's a formality. But for guys like me coming out from JUCO, from prep school, they want to they want to see you go up against their guy. So I'm, I was there going up against three seniors and a, a JUCO guy they had already committed, like, in the workout. Like, so you really had to, like, that was make or break. Like, if I didn't perform, like, there was going to be no offer. Damn, okay. So, like, it was like, like, put up or shut up at that yeah. point. So, you got to perform. Like, I mean, hey. know, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. I, but that's that's cool because, like, for me, I, I hooped in high school, but I wasn't I wasn't good enough to be even considered um, for, for uh, basketball. So, I was always just curious as to, you know, what it was like, you know, if there was a difference between – you know, people com- competing for a scholarship or not, like, how is the process? Because it's similar. I mean, there's always levels to everything. You know what I'm saying? So I was just uh, curious about what your journey was like. And just to, like I said, give people more perspective of, like, even when you are um, when you are competing for that scholarship, when you go to that school, know that, be ready. Because you're not, they're not playing you against the freshmen from last year's class. You right. go to the seniors. And they eat, they try to eat your food, and they're gonna see. Are you gonna let them eat your food? <laughs> now you get to University of Albany, right? You got a scholarship, and also it's dope that you you fought for your scholarship, and you realize that like, I'm not getting no student loans. I'm not taking shit out of pocket. You know what I'm saying? Because um, that's a game changer. <laughs> Having that yeah, for sure. and that security and also, you were somewhat aware of that, like, for me, I didn't even realize student loans, it was just like, I didn't realize 
the gravity of the situation and how I could have been approaching it. So, you know what I'm saying? For you to even have the foresight uh, to realize that like, nah, you know, what I mean? you know what I mean? Like, first of all, I want to be a hooper, but second of all, I'm fighting and like, I'm standing on my value. I'm scholarship worthy. I'm not prefer walk on and then a scholarship. Nah, I'm scholarship worthy and standing on your value because as you as you found out earlier, if you let people lowball you, they will lowball you and they will go as low as you let them. So that's that's dope that you stuck on your thing. And you were like you said, zero stars, but fuck it. I'm standing on mine and this is what I want. And like you said, if you stay with it and you stay over time, eventually the people will see the value and they saw the value and the rest is history. So now talk about uh before you get to the hoops of Albany, I want to talk about like your college mindset as in terms of what made you be a communications major and a, and a minor in, in business. Was it just like a formality or did you have like a plan behind it? Um, definitely wanted to get into communications, like organizational communications, uh, a little bit of interpersonal communications. So I didn't really have an interest too much in, in anything else. Uh, and then maybe my second year, I took a, a finance class or something like that. And business started to interest me a little bit. So I took that on as a minor. Um, I was really interested in history, but the classes weren't really like what I thought they were going to be. So history was going to be my minor, but then I switched it to business. And I mean, I liked the communications program. It was cool. Um, just that whole like all the different theories and stuff behind it interested me so it was just a nice fit okay yeah and it, had, it had nothing to do with numbers like <laughs> i didn't want to do nothing with where i had to take math classes or anything like that and that's what i mean if i would have majored in business i would have but as a minor it was no not too many not uh too many math classes like at all so i was like all right that's cool like we can work on the other side of business that's not the the numbers and the calculations and the formulas like it's the side of business like i'm interested in i feel that i feel that and yeah. and and that's dope that you had a game plan you know what i'm saying because most people just use those majors as formalities and that's that's a waste that's the waste of like why you're going there you know what i'm saying like you should use you should use your your major as like a, a gateway to what you really want to do you know what I'm saying? Or, or it's not what you really want to do of like, what are you interested in? You know what I'm saying? Because I think a lot of times, especially in our community, um, we don't realize the power of networking inside of college, you know? And, and for me, I would like, I didn't have a, a platform, nor did I have anyone to lean on us. So like, no, how do I do this college thing? You know, I had to figure it out myself and how do I get opportunities um, with big organizations with not knowing anyone? And, that, and it took a sales opportunity, opportunity that I got offered while in college to make me realize that networking is, is it, you know? And, and, it, and it starts with your major because if you pick a major that you're interested in, you're gonna be in the building with people who may have connections already in that major and they're just doing, the degree as a formality because they know they got the job lined up and you could be that could be your, your classmate and then it, it pops off from there so you know it's important that student athletes realize like even from the like even from the major you should be strategic about it even if you know you're going first round for d1 or or three and out whatever the case may be two and out whatever the case may be like having a chance to be in classes or be around professors who may have been in the profession and now they're coming back to teach, that's invaluable. That's the key to it. You know, that that's the that's the key to it. So now let's get to the to the basketball, right? You went from freshman year averaging two points a game to sophomore year, 17 points a game. You were the first ever player in Albany history to be a sophomore named first team all conference. You set a school record for made field goals and you were second in school history in points in the season. So freshman to sophomore year, what changed? Kind of like, it was kind of that same change. And it's like a bit of theme for me where I go from, 
okay, I'm here, I'm happy to be here to, okay, no, like I, I, I shouldn't just be happy to be here, I can be here and I can excel. Like, that's how it was when I made varsity, I was like, all right, I'm happy to be here. And then I went from, okay, I'm here, now let me do something with it. Just like I went to uh, freshman year, I was happy to be, like, I was D1, made it like, you know, uh, in my mind, I'm like, okay, hopefully I can start like in a couple years, like, and, and say I played Division one basketball. And then I went from, okay, happy to be here to like, you know, like I can, I can do more than that. And so that flip, that switch kind of flipped. Like, I mean, when I would, I, when I would get in freshman year, like I would produce, like in the short minutes I had, I would produce. And that just kind of like, like lit a spark. It was like, okay, if I can do this in two minutes, like imagine what I can do in 30. So the goal was to be the starting point guard my sophomore year. And so in the, like in the season meetings, when they go through your whole season and like what they expect from you, tell you what you need to work on for next season, you know, you can see, I don't want to say the doubt, but I don't think they knew like what they had, you know what I'm saying? That type of thing, like they knew I could be a starting point guard for them, but I don't think they knew that I could be a potential, the best player like in the league. I mean, I felt like I could do it, but I wasn't gonna say, okay, I'm gonna come back next year <laughs> and be the best player on the team. I just said, I want to start next year. Yeah, I just said, I want to start next year and that's my goal. And they said, okay, you have to do X, Y, and Z because we're losing three guards, we're losing three seniors. Um, and we're bringing in three guys who can replace them right away. We're bringing in three Juco guys who can potentially start next year. And they said, it's up to me, like, what to do with that opportunity. And so that whole summer, went back home, uh, playing five on five, working out, just killing everybody, like going in every run, like killing everybody. Like I got like one of the assistants, Coach P, called me like, "Hey, did you play with so and so?" He just called me, so he just went in and killed everybody. Like so, like word is getting back to my coaches, like they're wondering, like, why he only played two minutes a game. Like, why is he only doing this? Like, he just came into the gym and just like, like, how is that possible? So like, they're thinking it's like a, like an attitude problem or something. They're like, no, we have to see your guard. No, we have to wait for the opportunity. So like, it's a little bit of like pressure building up. So like, they're getting like anxious to see what I do in summer workouts. So summer workouts come, they bring in all the new players. Um, and so we play, uh, play one-on-ones after every workout in the summer and we work out maybe like three individual workouts a week and we play maybe two three four games one-on-one -on -one. so for six weeks so the whole six weeks of the summer I won every single one-on-one -on -one. like no matter what yeah. group I was in no matter who matched up with me so that's three times a week at least three I'm games hungry. a week for six weeks I didn't lose one game no matter who was in my group, I didn't lose. And so after the summer, like it was just like I was gonna be the starting point guard. Like it was it was established. Did you start building a routine or did you have a routine in place that you would do <clears throat> that allowed you to have consistent success? Um, I would say that started in uh like second half of prep school where I wasn't in a system. I was by myself. Like I had to like get get up myself. I had to like go on YouTube. I search my own like weightlifting program. Like drills I can do. Literally, like I'm in the gym. Like trying to make 300 shots a day. Like I'm getting my own rebounds. Like and that just built a different type of like a different type of breed. Like where like I don't want to miss. Because if you if I miss, I gotta go chase my rebound. Like I gotta like, so I'm in a gym. Like I don't expect to miss. Like that build that mindset. Like okay, if I miss, then I'm gonna have to go get my own rebound. I'm gonna have to do this, do that. So like it got to the point where I'm going through drills. Like where I'm making 10 or 15 shots from the spot. And it's like okay, I can't miss. Like, 
I'm literally like, I'm not going to miss because then that's it's gonna create more running and like no one likes running. So like you just get you I promise when you work out by yourself, you oh yeah, get a whole different, you get a whole different mindset. So like just get into that little routine and then even taking it a step further in college and like doing the extra stuff. So like I feel like even like my whole freshman year, I don't think I did anything extra. Like, cause I was so used to like, just in high school, like nobody like pushing you to like, to do extra, like, I don't think I did like a, a what you would like, a real workout, like my whole high school career. Everything I did was practice, you know what I'm saying? Like I never went and got like extra shots up. I never went and like worked out by myself. Like I just never did it. Like. That's real. Like, I never did it. Like, That's real. I, I don't know. Like it's not like I wasn't lazy. It was just like do you think I never you, did it. Like, do you think it was like more of like you didn't want to do it, or you didn't realize that's what it takes, or maybe a little bit of both? It was a little bit of like if I had free time, like I want to play five on five. I don't want to work out. I don't know if I saw it as like boring or whatever, but definitely uh advantages to it and like once i started to get like a little routine like in college like then in the summers like i, I used that to carry it over but like all throughout high school like i didn't really do it like it was like it just wasn't important to me like i never really went to camps nothing extra like that like if we had practice okay i was going to go to practice but if it was something extra like that wasn't five on five like just going in the gym and shooting i like i don't know i just didn't do it like I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But and I got into that routine in college. And that's when I like started to actually do it. And definitely benefits you. So I, I do think about like, damn, like what if I took that extra time in high school? Like what if I did? But then at the same time, I'm like, I'm always, everything happens for a reason type of guy. Like it wasn't like, that wasn't part of what I was supposed to be doing. Like I was supposed to be playing five and five building my game up that way yeah and also it's it's a reflection point you know what i'm saying because like like we said we you can't dwell on it. it it already happened it is what it is you know however it's good to recognize that okay that's what was happening and then at least i made the correction you know you can't beat yourself up on I, I, either at least you made the correction like oh okay you know um this is what's happening now i got a routine and look at the results and it's just if anything it should be fuel for you staying consistent with it and that's how you elevate and grow your career and realizing like let that high school be fear of like damn i was nice but i wasn't all, i wasn't um taking advantage of it and that's where it got me when i didn't take full advantage but then when i started taking advantage in prep in college look where it got me it got me to place right. You know what I'm saying? And then when the season hits and now you're in your journey, in the fever journey, now it's like, all right, I got to remember, I got to stay consistent with this routine. I got to be persistent with this routine because if I don't, that's what it was. And if I do, look what's keep, look what keeps happening. Look what keeps happening. It keeps growing. It keeps, it keeps elevating. So being a student athlete and kind of being more aware now, what is something that, University of Albany, you wish you would have took advantage of, like a resource or maybe networking that you didn't. Like maybe not something like something that you weren't aware of, or like didn't really think about. Um, I don't know. I feel like they did a good job of making sure we maximized um, uh, our opportunities. Um, maybe like, like little things like in Florida State, we did a lot of like work in the community at Albany, not so much. So maybe that aspect of it, like maybe being involved in a community a little bit more, um, you know, taking like more outside projects, like, um, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And that, that is important because like you said, that's that's the exposure that we're, we're talking about, you know what I'm saying? Um, and seeing the you seeing you 
You know what I'm saying? That that's inspiration because it's like, oh, okay. It's kind of like the Steph Curry effect, where it's like, yo, he he has a similar kind of build, and you know what I'm saying? He's not six eight, and you know what I'm saying, two twenty. You know what I'm saying? He 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 resonates with me, you know, and, and things of that nature. So now that you mentioned Florida State, let's what made you choose them over the other places that you could have been a grad transfer at? What was your what was your thought process behind that? Um, when I decided to transfer, um, a guy that was helping me pretty much had me write down my top five schools and Florida State was on there. Um, and they were actually, they were the last to reach out. So, you know, we're going down a list like A, B, C, D, like they reached out. Okay. Cross them off the list. They offered to cross them off the list. We got the visit set up there. Like, okay. And at the end of like, almost the end of the process it was Oklahoma and SMU were like the, the two schools I was going to visit for sure because you get five visits so those were the two schools I was going to visit and then Florida State came in late and it was like instant connection okay they're on my top five schools like the, the assistant recruiting me is from Chicago like it's cool like it's like almost a perfect fit they're losing their starting point guard they need me to come and play like 20 minutes a game which for them is significant minutes like it's just a different like there's a chance to grow in a lot of different ways there's a chance to win um so at the end of the day I felt like I accomplished everything I set out to like individually at least like I proved what I can do as an individual like I scored faster clear to score a thousand points like I did it in a year and a half like like doing stuff that like all right, I don't gotta prove my like self worth as a like as an individual. Like I prove what I can do. Like now let me try to go somewhere where I can be a part of something bigger and try to win a national championship and be like one of the one of the best teams in the country. So it was that kind of like all right, I want to play in this NCAA tournament. I want to win. I want to be a part of something special. And then playing for a Hall of Fame coach. And then a black Hall of Fame coach at that that's gonna set me up for life after basketball was huge for me, like because like the the family culture was crazy. Like those are like lifetime connections, like that I'm definitely gonna take advantage of when I'm done playing. So to me, it was like probably like the best decision I could have made. Yeah, and and talk about talk about that season. What was well first since it's it's March Madness time. Talk about playing in the NCAA tournament and making the Sweet 16 and then and then just talk about the the overall just playing ACC basketball. What was that like? It was crazy. It was a crazy year. Um, Duke was loaded. North Carolina was loaded. Team was loaded. Um, just battling those teams. Like those home games were crazy. On the road, it was crazy. The ACC tournament was crazy. It was just... It's like, it, it doesn't compare to anything. Like, that's literally the highest level. Like, I think we were easily the best conference in college basketball that year by far. We had seven or eight ranked teams. Like, half the teams were ranked. And even if you weren't playing a ranked team, you might run into a Boston College or a Kai Bowman and play for the Warriors. Like, you're running into guys, like, every night. Like, the league was so stacked. So just that experience is crazy. Like, I'm going to look back on it, like, in every game, it's probably going to be, like, two or three guys. I can say, oh, yeah, he's on this team. He's on this team in the NBA. He's on this team. So that experience is crazy. Playing an NCAA tournament is nothing like it when you got 5,000 people coming to watch you practice. And then it's not even a real practice. You're just out there shooting around. Like, it's a spectacle. Like, it's great. It's nothing like it. Um, and, like, I always say, like, I feel like if we were healthy, if I was healthy, if Phil Crawford was healthy, if Trent was healthy, like, I feel like that team was going to a Final Four. Like, because when you look back on it in, like, two, three years, and you see – like, it's going to be about, like, I feel like six or seven NBA guys on that roster. Like, people are going to look back on that roster in, like, two years and be like, damn, that team was crazy. I I agree. I agree. Those games were were fun as heck to, like, be a part of, you know what I'm saying, as from a student perspective. 
and I got I was in sports marketing, so I got to, you know, be qu- kind of courtside and, and have a different experience, you know, being on the court a couple of times. And I was there, I was, uh, the, the Zion game, you know, that Duke game was insane. Just like 20,000 people, ah, and then 20,000 people were silent. <laughs> And then, oh, and, then, and then the final silence, you know what I'm saying? That three, yo, that thing was crazy. That game was crazy, bro. The fact that, and I, cause it's important. You always had the end in mind while you did the, the now, you know what I'm saying? Realizing that if I'm here, the network of people and the fact that they're actually going the extra mile to, to ingratiate themselves to me and let them know what they can do for me. And like you said, you talked about network and how it was like a brotherhood. And also you mentioned in prep, how it wasn't like that and how, and not every basketball team has that. And people don't, like the out, the average person doesn't realize that's what makes the great teams great is that they have legit chemistry and they have a legit connection. It's not just only about talent, you know, it's about that, that connection and how you realize that I'm going to use this connection. And then more importantly, I'm a hooper. So this platform is definitely, if I handle my business, like, I, like I'm doing, it's going to op- provide me an opportunity for the later. You know what I'm saying? So um, that, that's, that's dope. You know, and I keep bringing it up because that's important. You always have to have the end goal in mind. You know, plan for the future. Yeah, people, people, a lot of people, you see memes or motivational memes like, you know, focus on the now and, you know, one day at a time. Yeah, that's cool. But if you plan on living a long time, then you might want to plan that out so you can live it the way you want to, yeah. you know? So with sports management, because that's how me and you uh, became uh, friends is through the sports management program. Was there a specific reason why you chose sports management or it was just whatever? Oh, um, my visit. That was one of the programs that stood out to me Um, because, you know, you can't just go. You got to go to school, too, and you play basketball. So, And they had the number one program in the nation. Um, My original goal going in, (laughs) my original goal going into school was to be, like, an athletic director. And so, like, that went hand in hand. Like, you need a master's degree and then a master's degree in sports management, management, uh, uh, undergrad and communication like that's like the perfect combination and then my focus switched to more so like wanting to be a coach and that also aligns with um sports management and talking to people like so again perfect combination and so I mean that's what I went with and the classes like were so interesting to me like when they were giving me the list they're like okay you're taking a recruiting class you're taking an advertisement class and I'm like Bro, this sounds like fun. Like this, like sports law. Like, I'm like, bro, this sounds fun. Like, what do you like? Yeah, like sign me up. Like, okay, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and and to your point, uh, I like how you describe it as fun because I think that's how that's the cl- that's the classes or that's the major you should be in where it sounds fun to you or it sounds interesting to you. You know, and for you. You were a little bit more strategic than I was in the fact that you did something different in undergrad and then something different in grad, but they're all translated to the same thing. You know, like for me, I'm always agent focused. So I just did, or in management focused. So I always did sports management. I did undergrad and masters when like, looking back, it's, it's kind of useless to be honest with you. Um, in terms of like um, what that degree could do for me on its own. You know, maybe looking back on it, if I know I want to be an agent, maybe do something like finance or accounting and understand numbers and, and budgets, you know, but you can could, you could self-learn that. Um, but Yeah, you can self-learn for sure. Yeah, exactly. And, but it's, it's, it's dope that, like I said, you always had the end in mind, bro. And, and that's what it's about. You, having the end in mind and, and also going back to college, it's, pick something that interests you or you have a passion for, you know what I'm saying? Don't pick something because you think it's going to make you the most money because in reality, all degrees, degrees don't make you uh, the millions or even the 250,000. A doctor works, goes to school for 10 years to only make 100, 120 on average. You know, it's 
it's the extra things or being a business owner that really makes you the big money everyone talks about. So if you're going to go to college to learn skills, but you shouldn't just learn skills, you should also network. That to me is the, the perfect 2021 and going on. I like uh, talking about that and making sure people get that perspective. So Sweet 16, I want to just talk about what made you, what was your focus on academics? Like you were always first team, all academic or, you know, academic player of the year. What, what was so, what got you so locked in on that? Um, I mean, to me, like people, I always roll their eyes and they say, okay, whatever. When I say college is easy to me, like I'm a very organized person. And every class has a syllabus that says, okay, you need to do this, 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 and this by this, 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 and this date. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do that. This, 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 and that by that date. And at the end of the day, it's probably gonna work out. Like if I if I do what this sheet of paper says, like everything's on time, like there shouldn't be any problems. Like, and so that's just the approach I took like since my freshman year. Like it sounds crazy, but like, I just tell people I did the bare minimum to get an A. Like, which, so the bare minimum to get an A might be a lot of work in some classes and it might not be that much work in another class, but I did the bare minimum to get an A. Like, I mean, that was just my mindset. Like, try to get the best scores, pop, like work harder, not some, work smarter, not harder. So that was my mindset for each class. Like, do what that sheet of paper says you'll be fine. Yeah, to your point, uh, I appreciate you saying that. I don't think you're doing the bare minimum. I think you were working smarter, not harder. And you, yeah. you just read directions. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You read and followed the directions. And you just realize if I just follow these directions, instead of being, because most most students, you know, regardless of of college, high school, whatever, we don't read the syllabus, <laughs> you know, you just go with the flow and you just, oh, you're here, test at the end of the week. And you're like, all right, I gotta start studying this week. Where someone like you is like, I read the syllabus. I knew this test was coming two weeks ago. So I, instead of having to do three hours of studying for the next week, I could do 10, 20 minutes here, 10, 20 minutes here, 10, 20 minutes here, get attention in class, I'm good. It's, it's the little big things sometimes, you know, that make the big difference to be successful. It's work regardless. I mean, you know, I think a lot of times, a lot of people, everyone does it. We try to downplay the work, you know, when, when we're explaining to someone to encourage them or inform them, instead of making them realize, nah, it's, it's work, but you want to be successful, right? You want to be good. You want to be great, right? <laughs> you don't want to just come in this and be average or not have success. So if you want to do that, it takes work. Now, if you don't want success, that all right but okay then keep doing what you're doing but if you want good if you want great if you want success it takes work so let me show you how to do it smarter which saves you less energy so you can maximize your opportunities elsewhere that's really what it's what it's about in my opinion so let me sure. ask another, another random question since we're talking about uh studying and all that do you listen to to audible or are you a book reader like how, how do you how do you keep getting information um for me i mean i like the idea of listening rather than reading because it's like second nature you can do other stuff while listening but i mean not, not too much like I, I prefer to read i mean i prefer not to read at all honestly <laughs> like in college like i found that like reading wasn't like if i had like 100 pages to read especially in like later like senior senior year junior year like when the readings get crazy i would just rather go find like maybe like a 10 minute like somebody talking about like the material like rather than that and like okay then i'm like then i'd rather listen to it you know if it's a short read all right i'm gonna read it knock it out if it's longer I'm gonna go try to find something else like to listen to, like, and then that's how I like retain information and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. All right. So, but how do you, how do you, how are you learning more information? Is it just YouTube University or, or do you, do you listen to podcasts? 
or do you listen like Audible? Like now or yeah. like back then? No, I'm saying now. Or it, now? It started back. It could have started back then. I, I, I'm curious because the reason why I'm asking is because I think learning in in books is something that I'm. I want to challenge everyone. You know, especially people look like us to get more involved in. Not necessarily reading is different because, like you said, it takes time, focus, and to be real with you, it's a challenge for me. You know what I'm saying? I have to be yeah. really interested to stay focused. Really locked in. You know, like it has to be really interesting for me. Um, I actually read my first book. I'm doing another interview with someone. My first book, front to back, ever, and I'm 26. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But I was, it's about branding and athlete branding. So I was locked in because it's something I want to know and I was engaged. So that's why I 200, I did it in like six hours. It was nothing. But for me, I like Audible and, and um, podcasts. And I realized, bro, there's so much information that people just give away about things that we want to do. They just make it long-winded. And they say, if you really want it, just read the long-winded thing or listen to the long-winded thing but there's so much information bro like i don't i i honestly could say there's nothing from school that i take with me today everything i've gained has been from books that i've listened to on my own and work experiences so that's why i i want to encourage you you know what i'm saying to like tap into audible is like 15 bucks a month you get a free book you get a book credit it's worth anything and they have free titles and there's so much information bro that just changes your your perspective and, and it's something that we as a culture need to get more um interested in you know what i'm saying just listening to information it, it can start with that not necessarily i mean you have to read though because you have contracts you want to run a business so reading is, is important but um as far as information, learning, there's there's other ways now where our parents growing up, the only way you can get information really was reading. Now we have the luxury right. of an audible where they put books in like cool voices and you can speed it up. You know, cause I listen to speed right. it up too. You know what I'm saying? So it don't feel even that long. Or when I play video games, I tell myself, if I'm playing 2K, I gotta listen to a book, you know, to make up for it. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like little things like that just to trick yourself into learning because leaders are learners, bro. And and I think we're all capable of being leaders in, in some form or fashion. It doesn't have to be just speaking to people, whatever. Just leader in your household, leader whatever. And um, I, that's just a challenge I have for everyone, you know, like Audible and podcasts, you know, not just this one, but there's so much game, bro. So much information, bro. I was listening to all the like political podcasts, like in both sides, like just trying to be informed. And then like you said, with school, like that information is good for like that class. Like it's, it's rare you're going to get a class. I feel like in sports management, we work more hands-on, like work experience. So it was great. But most classes, like what I did learning, I made flashcards. So it was flashcard knowledge. Like got my pack of 100, 200 flashcards, learn that material. But then once that class is over, you throw them away because you're not going to use it anymore. Like so, like you said, those podcasts, those books, that's what's that's what's gonna carry you on. So I definitely agree with that. Now that someone's hearing that and you're going to college, that's why I was saying and and we were saying to be intentional about your major because now if you especially you going to take classes that you're not even interested in or you know you wanna do something else, now you're just wasting your time and that's how you really your grades suffer even more because now you're not interested nor do you care. So what's the motivation to, to get a B or to get an A, to even get a C? All right, now let's go back to hoops, right? So you, how'd you build a relationship with uh, Go Empire? And, and what, what was your thought process post-college on how to continue your career? Um, I mean, so, I mean, when you get done playing, um, not everybody, but a lot, I mean, if you have aspirations of being a, a professional in your field, just like jobs come and they offer you, like we have this for you, we have this for you, we have this for you. Um, that's how agencies come at you. They, they, they tell you what they can do for you. And then it was just all about being comfortable. They were based in Chicago. So 
it was just a good fit at the time. Um, real good people. Uh, they care about you. Um, and then, of course, you got to look at what they had done. My goal was, like, I got to get a foot in the door, like, because I had, when their team's looking at you for Europe, they're looking at, like, for the most part, pure numbers. They're looking at your school's credentials and pure numbers. And I went from 17 points a game to six points a game. You know what I'm saying? So from a pure numbers, like not knowing anything about how Florida State plays, like 10 deep, we got three, four NBA players on the roster. They don't care about that. It's about numbers. So I knew I needed to go somewhere where I was going to get a foot in the door. And they, at that time, point in time, before COVID, had 100% placement rate. So that means every single one of their clients got a job. So for me, it was like a sure thing. Like I knew I was gonna get placed somewhere. I knew I was gonna get a job. And then from there, it's like up to me to do my job. You know what I'm saying? So for me, that's that's why I chose them. Okay. And then talk about Cyprus, where you were the rookie of the year. Um, talk about, first of all, like, the the culture and the scenery of Cyprus and and um and then after that talk about what what it was like playing professional rookie year like what was that what was that experience like I mean again it was one of those things where I mean this was the fastest it had happened where I went from okay I'm a professional basketball player like I made it I can say I played professional basketball to all right, now nah, like I can I can dominate, like I can be more than like I can make I can do this for as long as I want to do it. Like and it happened like that. Like in high school it happened gradually, in college it took my freshman year. But being a professional, when you're thrown in that fire, it's like, okay, you can't be happy to be here. Like it's either starve, it's like you got you gonna produce or you're gonna go home, like and like seeing that firsthand. So just that whole aspect of it was just like, all right, from 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 the word go, I was had a different mindset. Now year year two, right? So what made you go from Cyprus to Slovenia? What's the strategy behind that? Um, I mean, I don't it's a better league for sure. Um better teams, better competition, not too much of a jump up. Um, but a step up and you know my agency they're all about being patient and just like taking it a step at a time but like I'm to the point where like I just turned 25 and like I'm in that window where it's like okay I'm gonna play the top level like these next couple years gonna be like huge so like for me it's like no more baby steps like like next year I need to be like with the big dogs like with a, a, with the top like the top six top eight league like over here in Europe I mean I'm not gonna get too much into it because it's too much to explain but just th think about it like if you're an NBA player uh and you're on your third contract and you want to win a ring you're like okay I gotta get the attention of these top teams I gotta put myself in a position where I could be an asset to one of the top four or five teams in the league so kind of that mindset I need to put myself in a position where I mean, um, I can play at the highest level over here. What do you think you have to show in your game or like, what would it take for, is it like stats? Is it, is it championships? What does it take for someone like you to get into, get a, a foot door into like the big six leagues? And is it, is it like one league Israel, like one league Germany, one league Spain, like that type of big six, right? So the top, I say the top leagues are Russia, Spain, France. It's really eight, like Russia, Spain, France, Italy, Germany, uh, Turkey. Uh, those kind of leagues, like those top leagues. Like if you're playing, it's, it's called Euro League over here where Luka yeah. Doncic came from. Exactly. And that takes like the top, they take the top teams from Leo. the top uh, countries. So if you're in a league that has a Euro League team, it's, it's, it's a pretty good league. And I mean, what it takes, I mean, at this point, it's like 
to your what you were saying earlier, like it's about like it's it's a lot of networks and connections too. So like not saying like my agency's not that big. So like it it's gonna take me putting up crazy numbers to like get that attention. Whereas if I'm with a bigger agency, I can have average or not so crazy numbers and get those opportunities. So I mean it's coming to a point where I don't know I might mean need to take a step up in representation like to open those doors um or just like i mean it's, it's coming to like that decision point where um i'm producing on the stats wise and now it's time to like make those other connections like networking like like you said like even over here like who you know matters unfortunately it's it's the, the way the world works, it's not really based on what you bring to the table per se, you know, what you're bringing to the table. It's more of like, okay, you can bring this to the table, but, and then what, who, who do you know um, that we know that I like, you know what I'm saying? Or I, I, I just, I just, I appreciate you sharing that because it, it gives perspective as to decisions you have to make as a professional athlete of, do I bet on myself? Do I bet on the agency? Um, keep, am I keeping my, my options open? And, you know, even while you're playing a game against somebody else, but you're also playing the game of like, how do I get to my end goal? And how do I strategically uh, uh, place myself? Because this conversation translates to, to life. You know, for me, I'm thinking I'm building a resume and I got told by, uh, um a big sports brand that i was overqualified for a position you know what i'm saying and that told that told me when i got the back and back in scoop that even when you're the best you know it doesn't <laughs> matter if the other person's the best friend <laughs> you know what i'm saying it doesn't no, that's a fact <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And it's like, for me, it's like, I'm cool, like relationships helping you out, but I just don't like when it's like, you, you're blocking talent because of relationship, you know? And I, I just don't rock with that. Like if, even for, for me, if, if, if I was your agent, I felt like I wasn't the best one uh, for, for your situation, uh, but we're cool. I'd be, I would tell you like, yo, you should probably link up with them or link up with them because they can better assist you to where you want to go you know because like you said for agency perspective the player has to put the agency on and then the agency could put players on you know so if anything you would have to look at it like do i and do i have enough whatever to make them pop into where people want to call them for me you know what i'm saying or or does this my situation allow that in, in the case may be so I, like I said, you know, and then it's, it's touchy, touchy feely, you know, when you're in, in your career and stuff like that. So like I said, I appreciate the insight and, and like your perspective. So that being said, what, what are the perks of playing overseas basketball? And what are the challenge as being American? Uh, I say the perk, like the biggest perk, probably is like you, you don't spend any money. Like everything's taken care of. You get a car, you get an apartment. Bigger teams, you get money for groceries. Uh, the higher you, just basically the higher you go, the more like the more kickback you get. Like, like it gets to the point where like. If you get high enough over here, like you're getting sponsorship deals the same way, like an NBA player might be endorsed by Gatorade. You're endorsed by maybe like a restaurant or a car dealership where they're paying for your gas or like you eat free at that place. You go take a picture at the restaurant, they give you free food like your whole time here. Like, so it's a bunch of little different things, but I, I, I the main thing would be like, you don't, you don't spend a lot of money like out of pocket. Everything's included in your contract. So why, where the dollar amount might not be as high as you think it might be, you're not paying rent for eight months. You don't have to buy a car. You know what I'm saying? Like the little things. So all you, all you really doing is 
like they're giving you free meals like you go eat at whatever restaurant you want want for free so at the end of the day like your money is your money and if you save it wisely even if your contract isn't the biggest like you're coming home with like with something you're coming home with something so that's the appeal of um playing overseas and then once you get to that level where you're making six figures overseas it's I mean, you're set for real from there. And then the challenges, they expect you to be perfect on the court. Because, you know, basketball, like, America dominates. So they're expecting you to come in and put that work in. And when you're not, you can lose your job. I mean, just like any any other career, you don't do your job, you're going to be sent home. And then it's kind of like, how they expect like lottery picks to produce in the NBA. Like they want you to come in and make an impact right away. And that's what it's gonna be every year, every team you go to. And when you're done with it, they're gonna think something's wrong. So, and then of course the challenge of being away from home, being away from family, um, all that stuff that goes without saying. So it's benefits and it's challenges for sure. And it's not, I promise you, it's not for everybody. I promise you. I know like I know guys who did it for a year, they're not, they're done. Like, they can't do it. Like, they're done. Like, so you just got to be built for it. And then, especially when adversity is, you got to really love it. You got to really, like, have that end goal in mind. Like, you got to, like, especially me, like, if I make it to where I want to go, like, I know I really got out of the mud. Like, really, like, Started, started like one of the like lowest leagues in Europe, and if I make it to one of the top leagues, like really like, like I could really like say like, okay, I came from from like nothing over here and like made it into something. I hope this was like a good chance for you to just reflect on your journey and make you realize that every time my situation is always the same. I gotta prove it every time I I step on the court or I step into an opportunity. First, I gotta prove that I belong. And then I get in and then as I built the routine, as I've just stayed committed with it, I've achieved every single goal that I've wanted. Maybe not in the time frame that I wanted, but I've achieved my goal every single time because I just stayed with it and I stuck with it. And you handle the adversity as an adventure. You know what I'm saying? And because that's what it is. The whole, the success is the journey. And I, and what, I didn't really understand that until kind of like now. It's kind of like with, with this COVID situation and, and delaying the plans that I wanted. It's like this this journey of, you know, uh, branching out to podcasts and, and um, you know, doing editing videos and all that stuff, doing interviews or having conversations, sharing perspectives. This is part of the journey. And this is, you know, I got to, if I don't enjoy this, then even when I get to where I want it, is this not gonna, it's, well, you're not gonna get to where you want. <laughs> that First of all, you're not even gonna get there. If you don't enjoy the getting out the mud part, the playing in the mud, the digging the mud off your shoes, if you don't enjoy this part, you can't even get to the success. You can't even get to the enjoyment. Right. So that's like a, a big takeaway I've gotten from our conversation. I appreciate you sharing. And that's why I wanted you to come on is like, you're sharing a, a goal and a journey of, I had game, but even with me having game because of outside perceptions, I had to really show I, I had game. And I had to really deep, dig deep inside and see if I wanted to show if I had game. And I had to take chances. And some of the chances didn't work like I wanted. And then some of the chances did. But at the end of the day, I've been focused and I had the end in sight. And every single time I've had the end in sight, I made a plan. I've I've gotten there. I've gotten there. It may it may have not been one summer, but the second, third summer, I'm there. That's dope. And that's uh, a testament to you. You know what I'm saying? And and a testament to, to many others that are pursuing what you want to pursue. And like, this is what it takes. Like you said, it's not for everybody. You know, being being in the sports and entertainment industry is not for everybody. And you have to have a certain mind frame, a certain mindset to really be a part of this industry. And I like sharing that because in our culture, we all want to be in sports entertainment. You know, that's because that's all we really see and can like aspire, like really aspire to, you know, for the most part. So I like to get the perspective of because normally I don't have 
current athletes, but I like to get the perspective of, you know, this is what you can do outside of being the, 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 the athlete or the entertainment inside this industry. That's my perspective. Or these are athletes who realize this is an enormous opportunity. They loved it, but they're also doing stuff outside of it. And they're also branching out and they also uh, realize that there's opportunity, like you have a, a limited window and you could take, you could do a lot with that limited window. You could do a lot, you know, like I said, pro scores club is gonna go crazy in due time. If you, as long as you stay with it and, and, and that was started through your athlete uh, platform, your athlete career, you know? So it's like, if you want to be an athlete, all right, cool. Be an athlete. But once you get in there, it's business. And now start treating yourself like a business. Cause you are David Nichols. You are an LLC. You are an escort. You know, you are a business. You know what I'm saying? If you really wanted to, you could put David Nichols LLC, pay yourself like that. And then you could do, the whole tax deductible and blah, 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 you know? So you are a business regardless. So it, it's dope that, you know what I'm saying? You had that mindset and it, and it took different things and it took you seeking it out, you know, you, you sought it out and, and, and that's where it is. So uh, that, that is um, an amazing story. And we have Florida State University legend, University of Albany legend, Slovenia legend, Cyprus legend, you know what I'm saying? First team all academic, first team all conference, you know what I'm saying? Player of the year in high school in, in Chi Town, you know what I'm saying? David Nichols in the building. And like I said, thank you for, for being a part of, of the show, of the conversation, and, and sharing your perspective and, and sharing your not your knowledge and then sharing your situation, man. It was it was a pleasure. It really was a pleasure. Yup, thanks for having me on. If I can leave you with one thing, I would say this. Everybody's got different opportunities, but just be self-aware, but don't compare. Because I promise you, everything happens for a reason. Your blessings are coming. Just be self-aware, but do not compare. Don't be envious of anybody in a different situation. Don't hate on nobody because they got different opportunities. I promise you, yours are coming.